everyone, and thank you all for coming today to the Drawing the Line uh, session on sexual violence in Ontario. This webinar has been developed in partnership with Ontario Coalition of Right Crisis Centers and OFIA and is designed for grades 7 to 12 educators to discuss the use of education for sexual violence prevention. The session will make connections to the health and physical education curricula and provide planning and teaching considerations to support teachers in initiating and continuing conversations in a safer and supportive environment for all learners. It is funded by the Government of Ontario. Welcome everyone. Our collective work takes place on traditional Indigenous territories all across Ontario. We're grateful to be able to work locally on these territories, and as we move forward in these uncertain times, we acknowledge the enduring presence of Indigenous peoples on this land, including lessons they may have for us on the value of community, resiliency, cooperation, and determination. As members of Turtle Island, particularly given the influential position of educators, we need to build our mindfulness of our participation in the maintenance of colonialism. While land recognitions recognizing the enduring presence and resilience of Indigenous peoples, those who identify as settlers need to do more than simply acknowledge past and ongoing colonial harms. Particularly as educators, it is important to understand and actively attend to the ways colonialism and systematic racism impacts those whose knowledge is being shared, what knowledge is shared, and the ways in which it is shared. With this, we close our acknowledgement by asking each person here today to make a personal commitment to themselves to take at least one step towards decolonization. You can actively seek new knowledge to better understand the history of colonialism or indigenous cultures. You can support an indigenous led organization in your work or personal life, and you can commit to being an ally who advocates for the rights of indigenous peoples across Canada. Thank you, Robin. Although the live session will be in English only, the recap blog on the session will be made available in English and also in French. But please also use the chat and select Kylie's name to private message her if you feel you need support. So getting started today, I thought it would be important that, that we talk a little bit about the four pillars. To ensure that we create a safer environment for this webinar, our intention is that the language we are using and the questions we are asking are, are respectful. Our priority is also to create a safe online space for our chat. To help set a common understanding of respect, we're sharing guidelines for respectful discussion from the Students Commission website that is based on the principles of respect, listen, understand, and communicate in the chat box. When we show respect, we listen. When we listen, we better understand. And when we understand, we can communicate. And so the way I always like to think about this and I'm gonna ask you to respond in the chat box. When you think about listening, what does that mean to you? What does that pillar mean today? And how can this pillar guide your future practice? And I'd love to hear your feedback here in the chat box so that we can sh share a little bit of dialogue on this. I wonder how you foster understanding in your classrooms. What do you do? What does it mean to you today? And how does it guide your practice? What about respect? And what about communication? So I'm seeing some really great answers here, being open to other perspectives, actively listen without judgment, just making space for conversations without judgment again, thanks Heidi. I'm seeing lots of feedback that sharing how teachers are listening by being present and not having a formulated answer and to not focus on what our thoughts are, our responses are, but to really hear other people's perspectives. And I want to encourage you to take this step in your own practices, especially as you navigate these conversations with your students, because I think it's really important that students do feel that they're being listened to and understood, but also that they are having that step of respect and communication. Thanks so much for sharing your thoughts. Before we get too deeply into this, I do want to also touch on our duty to report. If a student's comments in your class raise concerns or questions. We as educators should talk to students individually and at an appropriate time. Understanding the context of the information shared is an absolutely crucial step in determining what, if any, action we must take. When talking with students about personal matters, be sure to make it clear that there are limitations to teacher-student confidentiality. If a student discloses that they are at risk of harming themselves or someone else, this information cannot remain confidential and kept only between the student and educator. 
As teachers, it is our duty to report this to the Children's Aid Society. Educators, you can seek support and guidance from your administration in fulfilling of this duty. Remember the context and remember to make sure that students understand that we do have limitations to our confidentiality. So in light of that, we showed you a slide as you were entering. We saw the D2L scenario card here where a friend sends you a naked picture of a girl he knows. And we asked, was it a big deal to share it with others? So I'm curious. I'd like to model some teaching strategies around this card. And I've used this particular scenario with my own students. I'll ask you the same question. What is stopping bystanders from intervening or supporting the person in the photo? I know when I did this with students in my own class, there's that notion of being cool and not wanting to be uncool. Feeling uncomfortable, absolutely. Yep. Peer yep. pressure. Yep. Unwillingness to jeopardize your relationships, absolutely. Yep, not knowing what to say. I think sometimes we expect that students have this notion that they're just gonna do what's right, but we forget that even we as adults can struggle with this. Um, having shame or not knowing that you need to report it, absolutely. Discomfort, yeah, not wanting to shake things up or feeling like they ratted on someone or worried that they'll become a target. I think these are really real feelings that our students have. Absolutely. Definitely. So when I'm modeling the instruction of this, I want you to understand that one of the reasons why I picked this particular scenario card is that the Draw the Line products offer multiple curriculum connections. And so currently I'm teaching grade seven and eight health and it connects beautifully to our social emotional learning skills and our healthy living skills. But in grades nine to 12, it also accommodates the curriculum expectations in the healthy living strand. We all teach different groups of students with different needs and experiences. However, what you'll see is that resources like this complement the social emotional learning and the healthy living strands in nine to 12. I'm going to show you a brief overview in the next few slides of how you might use this, these cards as a conversation starter with your students. And if you have any particular questions around exactly how it can fit to curriculum, you can ask those in the chat box and I'll happily respond to you as well. So why do we draw the line here? Well, when we look away from sexual violence, we make it easier for the perpetrator to continue and the violence. Every choice we make and every action we take, no matter how small, has the power to make a difference. So if we know that something like this is wrong, and I think most of our students would agree, we know it's wrong, why does it keep happening? Teachers, I'd like you to respond as if you were a student in the chat box. Why do you think it keeps happening? Yes, absolutely. I think there's a lot of social media normalizing this kind of behavior. Students struggling with the confidence to address peer pressure. Hope it'll just go away. Maybe being scared. Not wanting to feel isolated, absolutely. And feeling like it's either something we can't control or that it's not our job. Is it really right for us to speak out against it? Or they've seen it on television or streaming. It's letting them watch, it's letting students watch shows that maybe they're not ready for just yet. I think some of these things are absolutely true. I, I do agree, Julie. It is normalized in the media. And because kids are growing every year, new kids reaching at a next level of puberty. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing your thoughts. And so what I'm going to try and share with you is the way I would walk through this in my classroom, I would use this as an opportunity to start some of these conversations with my students. And I think you're right, Heidi. I think some of you see it at home. Absolutely. So then when do we draw the line? Well, consent matters. And consent is something that must be asked for every step of the way. What's more, sharing or possessing a nude photo of someone under the age of 18 can legally be defined as possessing or distributing child pornography. So again, the question I would ask to my students then, what is stopping bystanders from intervening or from supporting the person in the photo? Again, respond to the call-out question in your chat box. 
I'm seeing some great answers around, you know, so much screen time and that we've lost family time connecting and talking about content they're seeing on screens or hoping that somebody else will deal with the problem or they're, they're feeling that they're removed from the situation or don't want to get in trouble because now they've seen it. They have to acknowledge that they've been a part of this, either in receiving it or looking at it, getting in trouble for not speaking up sooner. Absolutely. Feeling shame or wanting to not get involved. I think those are all really valid feelings. Most definitely. Yep. Wanting just to stay unnoticed. Absolutely. So again, I use these in my classroom to try and initiate these conversations so that students, after they know we're in a safe space, they can start, start sharing some of their notions around these. Yes. Bystanders are a part of the problem. You're right. And maybe they don't have the skills. And so it's a really good jumping off point to look at legging skills in our students and maybe coming up with no ways of, to help support our students develop some of these skills. And so how do we draw the line? And what I try and reaffirm with students is that getting involved doesn't have to be and ideally shouldn't be a big deal because they always have options. With something like this, I always reiterate that it can stop here when you don't have to send that picture to anybody else. You can delete it and not look at the picture in the first place. And you can tell your friend it is definitely not cool. I always also reiterate the importance of a caring adult in their lives. And sometimes for students, that's mom or dad. Sometimes it's an extended family member. It's sometimes it's a teacher. And yes, thanks, Heidi, for pointing out. We, we've we done bystander intervention programs and healthy relationships with youth. And so increasingly, I'm trying to foster the development of that in my students. What I would next ask my students is, how can we realistically intervene if someone's nudes come across our stream? What are your thoughts? Respond in the chat. Now, just while people are formulating their thoughts, I also want to share with you that this particular scenario card has a knowledge product video that comes with it to support this item. And I'm going to ask uh, you to take a look after our, our discussion tonight. Check out the link on YouTube that we'll post into our chat box there. Um, it will further help you frame the notions of how you're going to frame this conversation with your students. Yeah, thank you. Raising our voices to say it's not correct. Don't respond to the person sharing the image. Talking to a trusted adult, not sharing it. Reporting an image to a host site. We actually just today had a really great conversation in my grade seven health class around, um, even if you don't feel comfortable talking to an adult, you can always report it to Facebook or Instagram or whatever social media platform you're on. And so thanks, we've got now that video posted in the link. I would encourage you to right click on that and open it for viewing after our webinar today, because I really think it'll help you frame some of these conversations. In closing this part of our, our presentation, I'm, I'm wondering, how do we know when to draw the line? So I want to introduce to you Rosalind. Rosalind is a gender-based sexual violence prevention educator currently with the Ontario Coalition of Rape Crisis Centers as their Draw the Line campaign coordinator. Acknowledging this crime is a social ill which impacts us all. She is passionate about supporting individuals to feel both accountable and prepared for building healthy communities. Rosalind has a particular interest in supporting professionals who work with youth given the importance of fostering pro-social values in the next generation to address this prevalent form of harm. Using she and her pronouns, Rosalind asks others to please also use these in reference to her. Welcome Rosalind. Uh, yeah, thank you, Robin and Andrea, for kickstarting us off today. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. Um, as Robin said, I really enjoy working with educators because they're usually a very engaged group and uh, know that educators play a vital role in shaping our next generation and our culture. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm going to go through some background knowledge for holding these important conversations know that uh, these topics can be challenging to discuss, especially if we're not used to them. So having some contextualizing knowledge to support uh, these conversations, because we want to help youth to understand the issue of sexual violence, uh, as well as know how to intervene and feel the responsibility to do so. Um, things like laws and policies are able to shape our society but we know that our culture teaches us our values that influence our actions. And so it's important that we create a culture that everyone can thrive in. And so connecting that to Andrea and Robin's uh, modeled good teaching practices, set, setting the stage with the teaching and learning norms through the four pillars uh, is a way of uh, 
helping to use these concepts in shaping, uh, supporting students to shape a, a society or communities that uh, is healthy for all of us. And so I'm going to talk about four things today before jumping into what violence is, we'll look over what consent is and then knowing what consent is when we do not have consent, what that means, uh, hint second point, and understanding violence, where does this come from? What are the roots of this harm and why does it continue to be so prevalent? And then our last section will be bystander intervention. So how do we support youth to intervene in these situations of harm? So starting with our first topic of consent, so consent is deeply rooted in the 2019 health and physical education curriculum. So uh, these concepts that we're speaking to today will help students to be able to identify, prevent, and resolve issues such as bullying, uh, sexual assaults and harassment, violent relationships. And so they're very um, applicable to the curriculum and developing our communities. So I have the Criminal Code of Canada's definition of consent on the screen. This one is in the context of sexual activities. So uh, it says the voluntary agreement to engage in the sexual activity, which must be present at the time of the sexual activity in question. So we know consent applies in all different contexts from hugging, tickling, using people's things. And so it's conversation that can be started um, as young as possible um, and then moving into more of a sexual context as youth age. And just to point out a couple words that are key in this criminal code definition, we have the voluntary agreement and uh, the present at the time and activity in question. So these are some key components that we're going to break down. But when we're having conversations with youth, this definition might not be very um, accessible. So to frame it a little bit more simply, consent is the approval of what is proposed. So we don't need to start with talking about conversations around sex. We can talk about respecting our own bodies and we have the rights to our bodies and uh, and then that bridges to the bodies of others. So knowing that if something makes us uncomfortable, that's not okay. And we have the right to feel safe and be respected and need to reciprocate that with others. So some kind of tying back to the criminal code definition, some of those words I pointed out and uh, making it more accessible for youth. I like to think of fries generally, but also in the context of consent. So this is a uh, little graphic that was developed by Planned Parenthood and is quite widely used in the sexual violence prevention field now. So these are the key components of consent. So we have freely given, nobody can coerce us into saying yes, it is our choice. It's reversible. So because we consented at one point does not mean we are consenting forever. If we were comfortable, and no longer are, we are able to take that consent back and that must be respected. So tying that to the criminal code that uh, consent is present at the time of the sexual activity. And consent is informed. So we know what we are consenting to. Uh, if we are consenting to specific acts, that doesn't imply that we are consenting to others. So again, the criminal code that uh, sexual acts in question. So, uh, we know what we are consenting to, and we are enthusiastically consenting to this. So if there's hesitation, uncertainty, uh, this is not consent, and also silence doesn't apply um, or constitute consent. So we need an explicit, enthusiastic yes when engaging in sexual activities. And then the last one for Fries is specific. So this one ties into reversible and informed. So uh, consent is not an umbrella concept. It doesn't uh, mean unlimited time, unlimited acts. It is specific to what is being asked and uh, tying back to that criminal code of the acts in question present at the time. 
So when we're having conversations about consent with youth, I find it can be um, really helpful to make this more accessible and give some tangible examples of what asking for consent uh, sounds like. So we can ask for consent when initiating sexual activities and should also be checking in with our partner. So ways of asking, um, initiating, we can say, are you comfortable if I hug you? Is it okay if I kiss you? Can I take off your shirt? So there's uh, different ways that we can initiate and then also checking in things like, do you like it when I do this? Does it feel good when I do that? Can we try this? And giving these ways of asking um, can make this a little bit more real for youth. And I also like to let them know that, you know, we're not raised in a culture that normalizes asking for consent. So even in, when you hug somebody, you should ask them, can I give you a hug? Rather than jumping in and hugging them, which might make them feel uncomfortable. Um, but our culture doesn't teach that to always be asking for consent. So when we start doing this, it can feel awkward. And I like to tell you that, that it doesn't necessarily come naturally for everybody, but that doesn't mean that it's not important. And the more we practice, try different wording, different phrases, find what feels right for us, it gets easier. And that also applies for educators and having these conversations, telling youth um, ideas of ways to ask for consent. It can feel a little bit strange at first and that's okay. That doesn't mean that it's wrong and uh, we can't be shying away from these conversations because we feel uncomfortable. And it, uh, it gets easier the more you talk about it. So, you know, just jump into those conversations and just like youth figuring out what words work for them. Uh, there'll be phrases that feel more natural for you. And so these are some important components to consent. We'll look at some times that or situations when we're not able to consent. So the first one listed here is if it's expressed by somebody else. So only we are able to consent for ourselves. We have the rights to our own bodies and people cannot be consenting for us. So thinking about um, younger youth and instilling this importance of their, them having the rights to their own bodies, we want to be making sure that we're not forcing anybody to do anything that makes them uncomfortable. So for instance, um, you know, you're at a family gathering and great aunt wants a hug, but youth doesn't want to give a hug. That is their, um, their right to have the decisions about their own body. And by respecting their uh, lack of comfort in doing this maybe, or allowing them to make decisions instills this right and allows them to see that uh, this is, is their choice of what they do with their body and uh, that that needs to be respected. And the second point is if the target is unconscious or incapable of consenting. So the uh, big one that really I think about here is under the influence. So consent is sober. We cannot be consenting when we are intoxicated because we are not um, coherent of our decisions and therefore we are not informed, one of the key components to consent. So even if youth aren't drinking yet or do not intend to drink uh, or engage with substances, um, having these conversations early before they are helps these values to become instilled in them um, and even if maybe they're finding themselves in situations where other people are intoxicated, building these foundations early is so important. And we're going to talk a little bit more about alcohol and consent shortly, because I find that's a big one with youth and, uh, and in our culture. So point three is if the accused abuses a position of trust or uses power to coerce. So thinking of fries, the first letter F is freely given. So nobody can be forcing us uh, into engaging in sexual activities, whether that's physical reprimands or social. So um, things like you are fearing you might lose your job or get bad grades or have 
uh, social outings such as personal information being posted online or shared. Uh, these are all forms of coercion that mean we're not freely uh, saying that we um, are comfortable to engage in these activities. So there can't be an abuse of power. Point four, of course, if the person refuses by words or conduct, and uh, this is both in the beginning if they don't want to engage, as well as thinking about how consent is ongoing. So if we were comfortable to start and we no longer are, we have the right to end that consent and that needs to be respected. And then the last point are uh, is age restrictions. So that one I'm gonna go to a slide for. So some, uh, when, often when I do meeting style workshops, I'll put a poll first of what the age of consent is in Canada. And um, a lot of people are unsure and it's because it's not a simple answer. It's not 16 or 18, there's different scenarios. So uh, the criminal code was amended to take into consideration that youth might be um, wanting to explore their sexuality. And so it was adjusted that under 12, they are not able to consent, but 12 and 13 year olds are able to consent to peers who are no more than two years older, 14 and 15 year olds, no more than five years older. And once youth are 16, there's no age restrictions, but between 16 and 18, the person they're engaging with cannot be in a position of trust or authority, such as a coach or a boss. Um, these uh, positions of trust, we're recognizing that 16 and 16 to 18 year olds are still vulnerable. And um, so once 18, legally there is, uh, you're able to consent to someone in these positions, but a lot of institutions have their own regulations, such as post-secondary schools, um, having regulations around engaging with professors and that being um, not allowed. Um, and so just to contextualize this, an example is if we had a 17 year old who is being intimate with their 21 year old volunteer coach, uh, is this consensual? So we know uh, that the age is not such a big deal, 17 and 21, but because the individual who's 21 is a coach to the first, uh, this would be abuse of a position of power and therefore that would not be consensual. And so without consent, we call this gender-based sexual violence. So this is a fairly long term, a few words involved there. So we're going to break it down into two and we'll start by looking at uh, the second half, sexual violence. So this is any sexual act or attempt to obtain a sexual act by violence or force. So again, this could be physical force. This could also be social. So if we're fearing for our well-being um, in a social context, then that is non-consensual and therefore this is violence. So some examples are childhood sexual abuse, isolated incidents of sexual assault, intimate partner violence or spousal violence, uh, criminal harassment, which is uh, more commonly known as stalking. And then increasingly, we also have cyber violence, which can take sexual forms, um, such as the draw the line scenario that Robin had shown about um, sharing nudes. So that would be a form of sexual violence. And that's um, with technology and especially during our current social context of everybody being so online is an increasing issue. So in Canada, we no longer use the term rape uh, in our legal and our criminal code. We, in 1983, amended this to include three levels of sexual assault. And so these were changed to emphasize the violent nature of the crime as opposed to the sexual nature. So we know that uh, sexual violence is about power and control, not attraction. So it's not someone couldn't control themselves or uh, a lot of different myths that we'll touch on um, in a little bit. 
but rather it is about having control over another individual. And this has very real impacts to, of course, individuals, there's physical and psychological adversities, mental health issues, eating disorders, substance abuse, um, and this can impact individuals' ability to contribute meaningfully to society and engage in their work. Um, and so this has further reaching impacts into society, um, both this ability to engage with society and the costs for supporting survivors. So healthcare, um, social services, social justice or legal services, and so in Canada, uh, childhood sexual abuse every year costs the country $3 billion. Isolated incidents of sexual assault cost $5 billion. And intimate partner violence or spousal violence costs the country over $7 billion every year. So that's just these three forms of sexual violence. That's over $15 billion. So um, that's obviously taking a lot from our society. And so this is an issue that impacts individuals as well as our larger communities, whether we were impacted by it or not um, directly. And so coming back to this point about it being about power and control, not attraction, because uh, individuals who have less social power in our society are more vulnerable they're therefore more at risk for experiencing violence. So this ties into the first part, the other half of the term, gender-based. So we refer to this uh, crime, this form of harm as gender-based sexual violence. As you can see on the screen, um, the statistics are that one in three women and one in five trans people will experience sexual violence in their lives. And it's a crime that does definitely impact men as well. Uh, one in eight men report experiencing sexual violence, though this note on the screen is that over 50% of men experience this crime before the age of 16. So they're experiencing it as boys, uh, as children. So because children or youth have less social status, less power in our society, they're more vulnerable and therefore more at risk for sexual violence. Because we know that uh, youth under the age of 16 are, it's um, the statistics, gendered statistics of who are impacted are quite equal. But then as boys age into men, they gain social status, social power, and their risk quickly plummets. Whereas women uh, continue to experience sexual violence past girlhood. And um, just a note that most studies fall along the gender binary. So looking at men and women as opposites with no other genders. So the statistic for trans people is um, not well studied and some research finds the numbers to be as high as one in two, which given our society that um, is dominated by people who are cisgendered or not trans, uh, the vulnerability that trans people face, it is, uh, we can assume that, uh, yes, this vulnerability would increase their risks of experiencing this violence. And then just the point at the bottom that uh, over 85% of survivors are women and 99% of perpetrators men. Uh, again, displaying the very gendered nature of this crime. But I do like to uh, always point out that while the majority, the um, most of the perpetrators are men, this is not to say that most men commit sexual violence. The majority do not, um, just the ones that do often do repeatedly. And, um, and it could be as that, uh, men experience violence at higher rates, but given our norms of men needing to be strong and emotionless and um, not uh, talking about, about trauma, uh, it could be higher, but this is uh, um, a whole other topic of, of uh, we could do a whole other webinar on that. But we will talk about societal norms. Um, 
And so knowing that vulnerability increases our risks of experiencing violence, gender-based sexual violence is therefore about inequality. So we have these social power struggles between identities of privilege and oppression. So the roots of sexual violence are in these inequalities and power struggles. So given uh, the gender nature of this crime, we know that women and gender minorities experience uh, less privilege in our society compared to men. And this is uh, culturally defined. So these masculine ideals that I just mentioned about being aggressive and assertive, not showing emotions, um, whereas women are seen to be opposites. And so they are seen to be passive, emotional, and requiring support, aka vulnerable. So these differences that are defined by our society, they're not natural, they're, uh, we construct them, they go past gender. So there are other forms of oppression we know, and uh, these impact our abilities to prevent, respond, and heal to trauma. So if we are more vulnerable in our society, more uh, socially excluded, this increases our risk of victimization, but it also increase, or impacts the ways in which we can respond to harm. So some populations uh, that I'll get into a little bit more in a minute uh, might have strained relationships with law enforcement, with the police from historical, um, historical processes. And so this impacts abilities to seek justice and healing as well. Medical supports, social supports, um, seeking justice. These can all be costly and or challenging to gain access to. So um, our level of privilege that we live with impacts the ways in which we experience uh, everything in the world, including trauma and how we, to, we are able to respond to it. So to kind of contextualize this impact of identities, uh, we're gonna look at how gender intersects with other identities such as race. So because uh, we live in a colonial society, one that values whiteness, um, we then this is a socialized um, concept within our society that uh, it impacts our thoughts and therefore our actions. So uh, gender and race intersect to impact our experiences of violence. Um, we know that indigenous women in Canada are three times more likely than non-indigenous women to experience intimate partner violence or spousal violence. And so gender intersects with race, uh, though these numbers might be higher than um, what our studies that we have find, because we know that there are historically strained relationships between racial minorities and law enforcement that uh, make reporting rates lower. So um, it's apparent that with the statistics we have, and uh, they might be even uh, more um, different uh, or higher rates than compared to the white uh, population that both living with the oppression of gender oppression um, as well as racial oppression impacts our experiences of how um, the how we see ourselves and the world sees us and therefore the experiences that that we have um, and this applies to all different sorts of identities that uh, individuals live with. So another one is ability. A report by Statistics Canada found that of individuals who live with uh, disability, 90% who experience sexual assault are women. So again, displaying that gendered nature of the crime. Uh, but then women who live with a disability are two times more likely than women without disabilities to experience sexual assault. So there is this intersection again of your gender and ability, your different identities and experiences of oppression influence your, um, your experiences in the world. 
And these are um, these concepts of racism and ableism and sexism, they are all created by our culture. And so they impact how people are treated. Um, so this there's kind of a dichotomy in thinking about women with disabilities as either hypersexual or sexually deviant. Um, and then to the flip side of that, uh, treated as children or non-sexual individuals. And so that um, shapes how we see individuals and uh, impacts their risks, as well as how we respond to their experiences. So whether we minimize the impacts they might feel or um, the outcomes, uh, having these misconceptions, these stereotypes, are all so influential in people's experiences of trauma and moving past them. And these are further contributed by not just our um, norms about identities of diverse people, but of sexual violence itself. So there are norms, just like we have norms about different individuals or groups of individuals based on their identities, there are norms that are specific to trauma. So we use the term rape culture uh, to describe the culture that we currently live in, in which dominant ideas and social practice, practices condone sexual violence. So rather than living in a consent culture, we have this culture that includes rape myths, rape jokes, and victim blaming. So rape myths are false beliefs about what sexual violence looks like. For instance, uh, it's common to use stranger danger, um, but we know that uh, opposed to sexual assaults happening in dark alleyways by strangers, the majority are, 85% uh, are by someone known to the survivor in private residence. And so these myths um, and create these stereotypes of what we think trauma looks like. Uh, and they are often either um, started or forwarded by rape jokes. So these normalize or trivialize trauma and, uh, and lead to these myths and victim blaming. So victim blaming is stereotypes about victimization, both what survivors and perpetrators should look like, how they should act, and they put blame on the survivor for their experiences and lift blame from the perpetrator. So things uh, like questioning when someone discloses their experience of violence. Did you say yes before? Were you drinking? Are you sure they meant that? Uh, any sort of way that, that implies the blame is on the survivor rather than the perpetrator um, is, is this form of victim blaming. So we looked at how our identities impact the ways in which the world sees us in how um, the experiences that we have both in experiencing trauma and healing and how our culture has these different norms that promote sexual violence to be uh, condoned and so uh, widely perpetrated. This is a lot of doom and gloom. This isn't, isn't happy talk right now, but just as our culture shapes us, we shape our culture. And I think that that's really powerful because um, education is how we are able to shift our attitudes, our understandings, and therefore our subsequent behaviors. And so that's why I'm so happy that uh, this many educators are here today because we know that um, having these conversations with youth, especially humans who are young and still developing their value system and, um, and their attitudes with the behaviors that follow, we are able to then develop a new culture, new norms, new ways of understanding and, and shift the culture that we're living in from a rape culture to a consent culture. So an example of this is the, I'm sure people have heard of the Me Too movement, uh, was pretty big on social media a few years ago. And so this was an awareness or public education campaign that really got conversations going about sexual assault. 
So the Me Too movement started earlier, but really took off in uh, October of 2017. And Statistics Canada reported that that same month and November, the month after, there was the highest number of police reported sexual assaults uh, in ever in any comparable data that we've collected. This isn't saying that there was a drastic increase in sexual assaults in our society. This is that uh, there was a drastic increase in reporting. In Canada, we don't have limitations of how long after a crime happens, you can report. And so having these conversations so widely in our society allowed individuals, uh, survivors to feel, to recognize what happened to them as sexual violence, to have the blame and shame and guilt that many people feel have that lifted or lessened um, so that they can seek justice and report their experiences. And having these conversations allows us to address the issue of violence, preventing it, because um, we're able to have these conversations that shape new norms about um, perpetration, but also who is able to intervene in these situations of harm. So when we're working with youth and, and supporting these new ideas and attitudes, it's important that uh, we support them to critically reflect on their contributions to inequality in our society. So what is their role uh, in upholding unjust systems and what can they do to change that role? And then we want uh, youth to be able to, after recognizing this, have the knowledge and skills to act. And we know that uh, confidence in our abilities to act increases the likelihood that we will. So um, youth might often recognize when situations are wrong, but if they don't feel confident that they can step in and make a difference, then less likelihood that they will. So that's why these conversations are so important to be holding. So we want to be promoting youth to be pro-social citizens, uh, individuals who support their communities to be healthy societies, and we want to avoid uh, the bystander effect. So uh, this reluctance to intervene, we call the bystander effect or bystander apathy, is um, when individuals are not offering help because others are present. And it's been seen that the more people who are present, the less likely people are to intervene. So it's called a diffusion of responsibility. And this is particularly true in cases of sexual violence because of these norms we talked about, victim blaming, rape myths, these ideas of what sexual violence should look like. So either we maybe don't recognize a situation of sexual violence or we have misconceptions about our role in uh, in these experiences. So for instance, relationships, uh, violence within relationships, sometimes people think, well, that's a private issue that's between the couple. Um, I, it's not my place to intervene. As we saw, sexual violence, of course, impacts the individual survivor, but it also has such wide reaching impacts on our communities. And so it is a community issue, not a personal issue. And so we want to be supporting youth to um, not contribute to the bystander effect, but rather be active bystanders who intervene, they use bystander intervention, not only witnessing harm, but taking steps to address it. So there's three levels that we'll look at in the next slide, but for all those levels, there's four basic steps and it is to notice the harm. So we have to be able to recognize that something is wrong, which in our culture that has these rape myths, um, it can sometimes not be obvious. So having um, that knowledge to notice what is wrong, we need to see our personal responsibility in taking action. So we need to see ourselves as community members who have a vital role to play in shaping our communities. And we need to know how to respond, have the skills to be able to. And then last, we need to do it. We need to step in and act with this awareness that we have. And I like to try to focus not so much on the targets and the perpetrators, who's doing what, who's right, who's wrong, 
but uh, promoting allyship behavior. So focusing on the power of the bystander to intervene and take action and be an active community member. So I mentioned those three levels. So we have primary intervention is before harm happens, let's prevent it from happening. Um, so we can shape our culture so that violence is not so common. But in the meantime, while we're shaping our culture, uh, if we witness harm, we can do secondary intervention and stop that harm uh, from happening or from continuing. And then the last is tertiary. We might not always be able to prevent or stop harm, but there's still actions that we can take that can make a difference in the life of a survivor. And so we're gonna look at an example of each of these, uh, but these three different levels of intervention are all supporting the development of knowledge and skills to that are uh, rooted in the personal safety and injury prevention content of the health and physical education curriculum. So they're very relevant to, um, to this curriculum and having these conversations with youth allows them to reduce their risks um, of harm at home, in their schools, online, and in their communities. So being able to manage risk is essential for their physical safety, their mental health, and their general well-being. So um, now to tie in the title of today's uh, workshop here is um, looking at ways that we can support youth to draw the line on sexual violence. So understanding their rights and the rights of others, recognizing the continuum of violence, what violence can look like and the impacts of it, and then understanding how to challenge these situations of harm. So we're gonna look at three draw the line scenarios, uh, one for each of those levels that we just looked at. So the first one is an example of a primary intervention. So that's preventing harm from happening in the first place, shifting our culture away from the rape culture that we live in into a consent culture that supports the well-being of all of us. So um, the scenario says that your favorite singer assaulted his girlfriend. Do you download his latest single? So in this scenario, we can think about why is it a big deal to support perpetrators of violence or people who support violence? And how does this contribute to our larger culture? And how does it contribute to the lives of survivors? Water, water break. So in this scenario, why and how do we draw the line? Um, so this um, scenario makes me think of the feminist slogan of the 60s and 70s is the personal is political. So all of our actions speak to our values and our belief systems. So when we let little things happen, we are supporting a culture of harm. Um, in By supporting people who perpetrate or support violence, we are both allowing the violence or this perpetrator to continue. And we're also telling survivors of violence that we don't value their experiences or don't, um, don't support their healing. Um, so as our actions speak to our values, uh, so do our inactions. So being neutral is, or not taking actions is not being neutral, but supporting violence to continue by um, not intervening and allowing it to, to go on. And so in a scenario like this, when we have a celebrity who um, we have been supporting and then we learn that they either perpetrate or support violence, we can of course just not support them. Um, so whether that's unliking them, unfollowing them on social media, not sharing their things um, on social media, not purchasing their movies or albums, um, not supporting somebody who supports violence. And then we can talk about it with others. So talking to youth about, uh, you know, if you're with one of your friends or a group of friends and somebody's playing music, um, somebody who 
who is known to be a perpetrator of violence, talking with their friends, calling them in, and having these important conversations about why it's important to not support perpetrators of violence. And I like to use the term calling in versus calling out because calling out can make people defensive. And uh, when people get defensive, they don't hear us as well. And we want people to hear the knowledge that we have and take this into their value system. So we want to speak with empathy and respect and from a place of genuinely wanting to share knowledge to support our community. And then the flip side of not supporting a perpetrator is we can support change makers. So if there's someone on social media who's um, supporting really great causes or sending out really positive messages that um, promote healthy communities, support those celebrities instead, follow them, share their stuff on social media. If they're posting um, about ways to create a safer culture or healthier communities, share that, team up with your favorite celebrities. Who knows, maybe they'll like and share your post. And um, so teaming up with, with change makers is uh, a way to counter um, celebrities who we don't want to support. So that's an example of uh, primary intervention, knowing that the personal is political and we want to be speaking to our values in all the ways that we can, wherever we can be showing our value systems um, and living by those is uh, what will shape our communities into ones where all can thrive. So in the meantime, before we've uh, changed our culture and made it so that violence doesn't happen, uh, we can do secondary interventions when we witness harm. So I'm going to bring it back to talking about alcohol and consent, because I think this is a really big one to understand to be able to have these conversations with youth. Um, so in this scenario, it says a party or at a party, your friend says, those girls look really drunk. Let's take them upstairs. Do you let it happen? So in this scenario, um, we want to be thinking about why can't we consent when we're intoxicated and why might some people be more inclined to force sexual activity when they are intoxicated? And then last, why is it sometimes more difficult to intervene if we're intoxicated? So there's all these different levels to um, situations of intervention with alcohol involved. So we're gonna look at why and how we intervene in this scenario. So we know that consent is sober. So um, at least 50% of sexual assaults are facilitated or in, uh, involve alcohol and or drugs. And alcohol is the number one drug used by perpetrators for committing this form of violence. So I think, um, I like to think of if you're too drunk to drive, you're too drunk to consent. And um, as our cultural norms around drinking and driving have shifted, we can shift our norms around uh, this drinking and hooking up culture that we have right now. And that would be a primary intervention, preventing harm from happening. But if we are in a situation such as this one in the scenario, uh, there's different things that we can do to try to stop harm, keep our peers safe. Uh, we can remove the target in this situation. So using excuses like our rides here or so-and-so is looking for you or we should go get some water um, or food probably will entice an intoxicated person more. So finding a way to remove that target from the scenario uh, and then we can also call in our friend who is um, speaking as they will commit harm. And so letting them know that this isn't okay, that's not consensual, you would be committing harm and giving them options. So you, know, you seem like you guys are getting along. Why don't you exchange numbers or social media and um, connect in the morning? We can call in others who are around. So uh, delegating ways that others can assist us, maybe someone's talking to the friend, somebody's bringing 
the target or targets uh, somewhere else. And in both calling in the friend and other bystanders, uh, this can be an opportunity for primary intervention, talking about you know, education of why this situation is wrong, as well as secondary, stopping the harm from happening. And for youth, um, talking about reporting it either to authorities or to a trusted adult in their lives, we want to make sure that we're, we're instilling that, um, you know, it can be challenging if they're not legal drinking age, but we still want to be able to have these conversations. Um, and so letting them know that you won't be reprimanded for, um, for drinking, but rather that it's necessary to seek support if um, in situations that aren't safe. And in different situations of secondary intervention, we can document, uh, get evidence. So if someone's being harassed on the bus or um, all different scenarios, taking recordings with the time and date and identifiable uh, information, but always making sure that we ask the target what they would like done with this, um, this recording. Because uh, since sexual violence is about taking power and control from somebody, we want to be giving the survivor control back and empowering them to make the decisions about their own lives and their healing. And so if we are not um, able to stop harm or we find out about harm after the fact and someone discloses to us, then this would be a form of tertiary intervention, the third level. So this says, your sister tells you her husband made her have sex last night. Do you change the subject? So we might not have been able to stop it, but we can still take actions that will make a difference in the life, life of this survivor. So uh, this brings up the issue of uh, rape myths that sexual violence doesn't happen in relationships or that consent is implied. So here we can reflect on ideas such as uh, why do we think in our culture consent is implied in some scenarios, such as relationships? How does this contribute to our society, our rape culture? And how does this contribute to the lives of survivors? So here, why and how do we draw the line? Sex against our will is sexual assault, period. It doesn't matter who the relationship is. If we are not consenting, then this is violence. So um, it's important that the, to note that these rape myths and victim blaming in our culture, they can impact how people respond to survivors, can also impact how survivors think about their own trauma. So a lot of people experience self-blame, guilt, shame, sometimes uncertainty about if the, what they experienced was trauma or not. Um, given these rape myths about what I, the ideas are of what sexual violence should look like and if their experience doesn't look like that or didn't look like that. And so the reactions that survivors receive to disclosures can really inform how they move forward in their healing, especially the first couple um, disclosures. You know, if we victim blame and we uh, make it implied that it is somehow their fault, then they might not disclose further or seek um, supports in their healing. So we want to make sure that we're listening with empathy. We are validating individuals' experiences and feelings. We're letting them know it's not their fault and what happened was not okay. It's really important that we believe survivors. So... Trauma can often impact our memory. We can have fragmented memories um, rather than a linear uh, story. And often it's sensory information like smells and sounds that are more um, deeply ingrained into our memories. So even if the story seems um, maybe not how we would expect, uh, we need to be um, validating and believing the survivor and supporting them by offering resources such as those at um, in schools, communities, confidential phone numbers, um, and we could be there for them, whether that's 
attending reporting or going to the hospital, social services. But the biggest thing for offering support is that we don't want to assume what they need. Um, we want to give options and respect what they think uh, or what they know is best for them at that point in their healing journey. And I do just want to quickly mention that it's important to also support supporters. So talking to youth about uh, secondary trauma, we don't need to use that term necessarily, but that uh, listening to stories of distress, of trauma can be, can cause its own distress. And so for youth having these conversations, letting them know that, you know, to care for others, we need to care for ourselves. So the schools across Ontario now have uh, mental health leads that are there to support youth's well-being. There's also the School Mental Health Ontario uh, resources that you can find online. They have information and resources on student mental health, um, some designed specifically for teachers, some for students, uh, others for their families. And having these conversations sometimes will open the door for youth to understand that they're having experiences at home that are not okay or in their lives that are not okay and uh, feel that you are someone who is able to hear this. Having these conversations opens these, these doors. And so um, it's important that you as educators take care of yourselves as well. So there's the school board employee assistance programs that are run out of the individual school boards, which provide professional um, consultations and assistance to educators. So keeping that in mind, and there's also in your follow-up resource package, the Ontario Supports for Students and Educators form that has confidential numbers and uh, websites that you can use. And this is my last slide. I like to put in my voluntary workshop um, workshops um, because I think that the majority if not everybody here today is here on their own time and um, so this quote by Margaret Mead says never doubt that a small group of thoughtful committed citizens can change the world indeed it's the only thing that ever has so just as you know we're talking about needing to shift our culture and uh, teachers are in such a powerful position to be able to do that. And being here voluntarily, it's apparent that we have some thoughtful, committed citizens with us today. And uh, so I hope that this knowledge was useful for you and you'll be able to implement some of this into your work with youth. So thank you so much. And I will pass it back to Andrea and Robin. Thank you, Rosalind. Um, it's it's very interesting to hear your perspective. I think you uh, offer a lot of knowledge and expertise in sexual violence prevention. Um, it's really important to remember that as educators in our role, it is in, it's our responsibility to ensure that our students require the skills necessary to respond appropriately to situations that threaten their own personal safety and well-being. And I like how you made your curriculum connections because in the health and physical education curriculum supports the learning and self-advocacy skills, conflict resolution, decision-making skills, as well as the ability to use assertiveness um, and even resistance and refusal techniques is so valuable for our learners to acquire in our programming. Uh, your presentation has provided valuable information that will help educators like ourselves to help students respond safely and effectively to these types of situations. So thank you so much, Rosalind, for sharing your presentation with us. Okay, so this brings us to our next part of our session and I'm gonna share my screen here for you. Um, what I've done is I've shared my screen to the actual uh, teaching tools uh, website directly straight to the sexual violence prevention education resources. Uh, my colleague will drop the direct link into the chat box. So when you come over here, um, you can see my cursor. I'm gonna move my cursor around the section where it says sexual violence prevention education resources. The first link is the duty to report. So my colleague Robin was going through that section already. I'm not gonna click that, just I wanna respect the time. I'm gonna click the second link, consent-based approaches. It will bring me to this page 
Well, all the resources in here includes the Draw the Line campaign, and it goes over all the, on the left-hand toolbar, how to get started, um, the why of why we need to teach this in, in our classrooms connected back to the health and phys ed curriculum. Um, and it also has the section where Robin was explaining at the beginning of how to establish the safe space for the students so that they feel comfortable in learning and also speaking their experiences and also what they're learning in the classroom with you. Okay, um, I'm gonna click back and now I'm gonna go into the activity section. Once again, you can also navigate to the different sections in the orange toolbar at the top here. So I'm right now, once again, in the activity section. Uh, Robin went over the one of the draw the line scenarios at the beginning. Um, and also Rosalind shared a few in her presentation. So you can actually click the different activities on the left side over here. And I'm gonna show you um, the photo sharing one, which is the one that Robin went over at the beginning of our session. And everything that you need is here from the direct YouTube link in our um, session that we shared in our chat box. Um, but over down here, if you scroll down, it talks about what this activity is all about, what you need to do. And I really like how it connects it back to the curriculum expectations and the health and phys ed curriculum and what you need to do. And in terms of what you need to do, um, it's really important to know that the lesson plan is activity is shaped into a three-part lesson from the minds on action and consolidation. You can check that out on your own time. The last part that I wanted to show you, so I'm gonna just show you how to access from the top toolbar, the resource database. So what we've done is we've housed all the resources in this area and um, from the EGAL Canada Human Rights Trust, Ways of Acting in Allyship, um, the Draw the Line Against Transphobic Violence, Postcards. Take your time um, when you leave the session to take a look at the resources that we provide on our website. Um, everything from getting the facts from healthy relationships, what is sexual assault, you can access that there, okay? I'm gonna move into, back to our presentation and then I'm gonna share the mic next with my colleague, Robin. Thanks, Andrea. So I know there's been a lot of information uh, passed to you already today, but for me as a teacher, I'm always thinking about how am I going to incorporate what I've taken from this session and how am I going to use this in my classroom? What am I going to do that is going to change the fabric of the place I am? And so I wanted to offer some ideas in terms of how are you going to take this and use this? So um, as you may be aware, School Mental Health Ontario supports every school board in Ontario. And I would encourage you to consider having a designated mental health lead in, in your school. Um, there are the take action resources that exist uh, to make mental health planning part of your board improvement plan. You can use it as part of your school improvement plan, but also use it to help support your students, whether or not you're teaching health and phys ed. Um, I would also leverage the expectations in the HMPE curriculum to discuss topics under the sexual under the hat of sexual violence prevention. So I know some of the resources that Andrea just showed us briefly, um, the website had listed the seven, eight and nine resources, but do know that there are resources specific for secondary contained within the OFIA teaching tools. Um, but also that a lot of a lot of the tools that are there can be finessed in order to fit whatever, whatever you are teaching. Um, I would suggest modeling the activity similar to what we did earlier in our session today. And, and I wanna pull back to that minds on component that we did in our session today and, and have those honest informa informational uh, conversations with your students. Um, if, it, if you're not super comfortable with this topic, use the videos from the Draw the Line resource uh, and take that step back to learn at the same time as your students. Because I think one of the most valuable things I do uh, as a teacher is that, I admit that there are times that I don't know and there are things I don't know. And when I'm feeling uncomfortable, I make sure that I frame that for my students because I think it's important um, as educators that, that we have that growth mindset ourselves and we share with our students that we don't have it all figured out yet and we're learning alongside them. And at admitting that vulnerability, I think really, really helps uh, students to understand that, that it's okay not to know and it's okay to be unsure and it's okay 
to feel vulnerable in these situations, but that working together is how we will move forward. So I think as we close, let's take this opportunity to note how important it is that it is to also take care of ourselves when dealing with supporting students and those that have experienced sexual violence. We have to work to instill in ourselves and our students the importance of listening to our own needs and also seeking support when it's necessary. So as I mentioned, all school boards have mental health leads to support student mental health and well-being, but school boards also offer school board employee assistance programs, which provide confidential professional consultation and assistance for educators. And there are, there's more information to support you in, these, in accessing these supports in the resource package that's going to be delivered to you. So Andrea, why don't you share with us next... Do we have any questions or answers that have come through throughout the duration of our webinar today? Um, we currently have no direct questions um, right now. Um, there were a few and my colleague has answered them directly already, but we'll open the floor to our participants right now. If you have any questions, feel free to go into the Q&A chat feature, Q&A feature on your screen. Uh, type your question in. Um, you can ask Robin, Roslyn, and or myself, and we'll try our best to get your questions answered. I have a question. Go for it. I'm wondering, so for, to my colleagues out there, I'm, I'm wondering, having now done this webinar and having taken it all in, what's your next step? What are you going to use from today? How are you going to change or introduce this with, with your students? So we have Jaylene, who's... Um, Asked a question, in the online environment, would you suggest having a Google form in case students want to share something or have questions? Thanks, Jaylene. I would suggest, um, for those of us teaching online this year, it, I want to acknowledge first that it is definitely not something any of us trained for. So I want to really give you some, some pretty huge props for taking it on this year. Um, I would suggest... Um, maybe asking students to share topics that they wanna know about. So sort of similar to the notion of having that question box in your classroom, but you maybe wanna frame it um, with students prior to having those discussions. So again, we talked about the, the four pillars, um, but perhaps also sort of giving them a heads up on what are some of the things they're gonna talk about. Um, again, you would, you would probably be a more of an expert than I am at this point in terms of what it actually means to teach online. But I would suggest having the conversations even in a, in a large group discussion format, similar to the way you would have it in your classroom, but offering the option of an anonymous chat or questions being submitted as well. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge that students are gonna have different comfort levels, just the same way staff do in having some of these discussions. And so having sort of backup questions and backup ways to, to get at some of the curriculum expectation for the class that you're teaching might be helpful. Thanks again for asking the question. Robin, can I jump in quickly? Um, it's almost like setting your physical and emotional norms on the online platform. And it's defining how to use a chat box, how to use a Q&A, where to ask direct questions just to the teacher so they know that it's um, private for the students, right? So thank you for sharing that, Robin. Absolutely. And just to, to give that extra contextual piece, um, I, I think it's equally important that students know whether they're online or in person, that duty to report still exists for you as a teacher. Um, just because as we talked about this, these kinds of discussions can bring up um, triggering events for, for people, but also um, it, it can encourage students to look for help for themselves. And so certainly where they are um, discussing harm to themselves or someone else, I think it's really important to, to reframe it again as part of that foundational that foundational piece as part of your lead up. So thanks, Jaylene. Thanks for bringing that up. I think too, to build off that, that uh, it's important in the resource package, there's a sheet of confidential numbers and online chats um, that would be beneficial to share with students because of the online learning format is a little bit uh, maybe less accessible to um, approach their educator that giving them other options for if they do feel they need support after having those conversations that they are able to do so confidentially, confidentially and, uh, and have a few different options for, for accessing that support that they might need. Thank you, Rosalind. 
I always- also want to encourage you, um, just as we're sort of talking about this, that um, certainly the 2019 curriculum is built such that we as teachers aren't looking at this as sort of a singular silo of, of health, or I know, Lorraine, you mentioned there your sec, your grade eight, seven, eight sexual health class. Um, I want to encourage you and also challenge you to, to also try and have these conversations as part of your mental health, as part of nutrition. Normalize these conversations so that it doesn't exist sort of in a silo of sexual health and well, we're going to talk about this and then we've done it and we don't have to come back to it. I want to encourage you to really look at that curriculum as, as um, sort of intersectional, sort of like what Rosalind talked about, and that these conversations can happen at any time. Um, And it's not to say you sort of uh, uh, surprise your students with these topics, of course, but that these topics fit within the context of mental health. These topics fit within the context of nutrition, um, drugs and alcohol, your substance use units. These things happen all the time in life. And so make sure that those students understand that these conversations can happen too. Thank you, Robin. Um, I wanted to bring up one more question and I am looking at my clock right now. Um, It's almost 5.30. And I'm gonna throw this question to both yourself, Rosalind and Robin. And this question stems from the example you gave Rosalind during your presentation with the singer um, with the draw the line card. Um, This participant has asked that the internet does make a lot of things blurry for students and also for us as educators in terms of understanding the safety component and just in terms of consent and what is not consent. Um, The participant is asking, what is your approach to subjects like this that may be exposed on a platform with so much information and misinformation online? How would you, number one, connect it to the curriculum and what is your advice and experience on that? Rosalind, I'll start if you don't mind. I think that really speaks to exactly what I was just talking about. Um, This is sort of the marriage of media literacy with health, like like that, cross-curricularizing everywhere we go. Um, I I think it really depends on sort of who are the students in your classroom. And again, it comes back to knowing your students and what do they know Um, and taking on those conversations because I'm not sure you necessarily have a right answer as to exactly how you should do that. I'm, I'm going to say, if it feels right to approach it in a particular direction, go with your gut. And again, sort of keep those tenets uh, of good teaching and good conversation there using using the foundation of all the things that Rosalind was sharing with us today. Rosalind, do you want to maybe elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, I was thinking similar to your last point, just of going with your gut, that um, I think we're really taught in our culture now to be um, logical in a way that we think things through, which is, you know, important and evidence-based practice is important, but also being in touch with our intuition. And if something feels wrong, to not just push that down and logically think that it it must be okay. Yeah. Um, but critically thinking and both as educators and instilling that in youth, the importance of, um, yeah, critically thinking about things and listening to Uh, what our intuition might be telling us. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, looking at our sources, right? Like we're saying sort of that media literacy piece, like where, where is this information coming from? Am I thinking critically about it? Am I hearing an unbiased vantage point of it? Um, I I think those, those pieces all come into play. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. Thank you. So as we wrap up, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. The attendance was amazing. Thank you to Robin, Roslyn, Kylie for facilitating our experience. As you move forward with your learning today, remember that OFIA has multiple resources to support your instruction, as well as additional professional learning offerings coming later this school year. We ask you to sign up to our OFIA e-connection and follow us on social media at OFIA Canada. Look for a recorded version of today's webinar coming in mid-April. Please take a moment to help us improve. Our evaluation for this webinar is included right in the chat box. My colleague's gonna share that with everyone. And we'd like, we'd appreciate if you took the time to fill this out. Uh, we will be sharing the link to the blog post and the recording with registrants once it is ready. So thank you so much. Thank you once again, Rosalind, Robin, Kylie. Have an awesome evening. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody.